We now continue with The Art of Magic. The natural world offers many and varied moments of wonder, but we tend to remember the big tricks. We date events in our lives from the flood of 74, not the drizzle of 82. So it's not surprising that magic, the theatrical art that overcomes the natural world, naturally grew bigger. Magic is about busting the forces of nature. The enchantments of magic point beyond illusion to the great mystery, the eternal transformation of life and death and rebirth. Magic, alone among the theatrical performing arts, asks a question, what does this all mean? This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. For centuries, this was performance magic. Cups and balls, coins and cards, entertaining just a few people at a time, on the streets and in the parlors and pubs. Then in the mid-1800s, the Industrial Revolution developed the technological means for aspiring grand illusionists to fulfill their dreams. And it provided them with an audience too, millions of workers in monotonous jobs, with a few extra pennies in their pockets, spare time for the first time in their lives, and a desire, a need, to be amazed. The magician is Lance Burton, the speaker is Jeff McBride. If you look at the old theaters, or if you look at theaters today, they're built like temples. They were palaces. Magicians moved back into the theater where they could create magical rituals and ceremonies again under the guise of popular entertainment. And they needed that entertainment, guys. If Lance Burton had presented this illusion 200 years ago, his audience might well have assumed it was real and that Burton was a witch possessed by the devil. He would have become the principal log on a large fire in the company of his underclad female familiars. But the Industrial Revolution also heralded the age of science, science we thought would explain all our mysteries, including the mysterious witchcraft of the professional magician. Because it's a trick replaced it's a witch, magicians were allowed back into the secular temples of entertainment to present the grand themes of life, death, and resurrection. Lance Burton is about to reappear in the middle of the audience, in the middle of a contemporary temple of ritual, ceremony, and popular entertainment called the Hacienda. What we're going to see is that the more people are presented with answers, the more people are told to stop caring about things, the more actively people will be searching for that intrigue and that kind of wonder about the world around us. And it might be ironic that centuries ago people went to the church for that, and today people go to Las Vegas to see it in a showroom. Las Vegas, an oasis in the desert studded with temples of pleasure, hope, greed, and the $3 all-you-can-eat breakfast. From the couple on a weekend package tour, matching mystical symbols to win elusive coins, to the big spender hoping the little white ball of fortune will fall into the right cup, magic is to Vegas what the Mississippi River is to New Orleans. It's always nearby, even if you never dive in. In this town, unbelievably, there are seven magic shows operating at this time and there is a magician almost in every review show in town. This is really becoming the magic capital of the world because of this. And Johnny Thompson should know. He's been amazing Vegas since the all-you-can-eat breakfast was 50 cents. But I think magic particularly goes over in Vegas because Vegas itself is about fantasy. People go there with, uh, with dreams of winning countless millions of dollars, of having unbelievable streaks of luck, of having uh, impossible things become possible. And that's, of course, what magic speaks to. Who's the magician? Is it just that weird guy with the funny black outfit? <laughs> 
Funny black outfit? Not anymore. Weird guy? Well, magicians are supposed to be a little weird, aren't they? Siegfried and Roy are big flashy guys with a big flashy act. For many Vegas visitors, their spectacle magic is a must-see experience, like Wayne and Shecky and Les Girls de Monte Carlo. Behold, Siegfried and Roy. For both tourists and Conjuring fans, the other Las Vegas illusionist to watch is Lance Burton, an erstwhile Kentucky farm boy who's been practicing magic since he was five years old. Among his biggest fans are other magicians like Jamie Ian Swiss. Lance has taken this form of the classical manipulative, what, what magicians refer to as manipulative magic, uh, the guys who produce uh, all these objects. And very often, most of the time, you see performers doing this type of magic, instead of wondering how they do it, you kind of wonder why. The answer is, if you can do it this well, then it's worth doing. Lance Burton's big show starts with small feats of wonder, a tribute to the legendary magicians who are his heroes. So he spews cards and cigarettes like Cardini and produces doves like Birdmasters, Channing Pollock and Johnny Thompson, who sees Burton not as another magician, but as the next magician. There was a lineage in magic. Keller at the turn of the century was the leading magician in this country. And he passed his mantle of magic to uh, a man named Howard Thurston. Dante uh, received the mantle of magic from Thurston. Dante passed the mantle of magic onto a man named Lee Grable. And uh, just recently, Lee Grable passed the mantle onto Lance Burton. With the birds back in their cages, Lance Burton starts the big illusions Vegas visitors expect. But his presentations are still classical. In this case, the backstage illusion, first popularized in the 1930s by Dante, where the magician plays the whole effect back to front so the audience can see how it's really done, or so they think. Lance Burton has the showroom and the means to make small tricks look big and big tricks look bigger.
Other magicians in other rooms use various techniques to make the relatively simple seem much bigger. Like Jeff McBride's water bowl illusion. Water returning mysteriously to an empty vessel could probably be performed with jam jars in a kitchen, but then it wouldn't be magic. The difference isn't location, it's showmanship. This is a padlock. It is currently locked. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you three keys. You may choose any one you like. Try the key in the lock. Go ahead, put it into the, uh, the hole of the lock. Now, it does fit. They all do. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you turn it and the lock clicks open, that means it's the working key. If, on the other hand, you turn it and it only keeps turning, then obviously it is not the correct key to open the lock, and you may take it out and drop it into the glass. <laughs> Nicely done. Try another. All right. For mentalists like Max Maven, who use simple and props to achieve inexplicable results, showmanship is vital to every effect. Nope. So in point of fact, we've established that none of the keys work, and that's because I kept the one that does <laughs> separate from the others. Uh, if you'll try it, it's cut almost identically to the other keys, but there's a slight difference, and it just snapped open, and we know that the key does work. Would you take the key out and drop it in with the others? Would you relock the lock? Thanks. Would you take the glass and swirl it around so that we mix the keys, so that you do not know which is the key that opens the lock? Fair enough? Fair enough. You don't. Take your seat. Four keys, only one of which works. Now, if these people were given the opportunity to compare the keys, analyze and examine them, they might be able to figure out which is the one cut differently. They don't get that chance. <laughs> Instead, I'll ask you, please, to take one key. Any one. Would you take one of the remaining keys? And would you take one of the remaining keys? And the last one is for you. One of the keys will open this lock. And this is a test, not of my intuitive skills, but of theirs. Because the four of you are going to stare at that lock holding your chosen key until you sense whether you have the key that works. And if you'll put some effort into this, I assure you that a few moments from now, one of you is going to realize that you are holding the proper key. And at that moment, do not hesitate. Stand up and walk over to the lock. Don't look at me, <laughs> look at the lock, trust your intuitive abilities, and when you feel that sensation that tells you you are holding the key that works, stand up and come here. Don't look to me for guidance. <laughs> trust your intuitive skills. Close your eyes if you think it'll be easier, but sit, ah! Now, you got a feeling that this might be the right key. Put the key in the lock, but don't turn it. We know they all fit. In a moment, I'll ask you to turn it, and if it simply turns round, well, so much for your intuitive skills. <laughs> On the other hand, if there's that 
reassuring click, and the lock opens up, then you've done it. Go ahead, give it a try. Besides showmanship, the ancient skill of storytelling can always make a good effect better. To me, a good story is as good as a good trick. And in fact, a good trick is a good trick because in, it produces a good story. Hiawatha, and a good story to go with a very small levitation. Once upon a time, Prince Julie went way up on the mystic mountain to visit the great wizard. But on this visit, he was very, very troubled. He said to the great wizard, I cannot learn these things. It is too difficult. And the great wizard said, Ah, oh, my son, you need to understand. Miaba. He reached into his satchel to reveal a tiny little doll. The doll wore a mask that had been fashioned from rejumba nuts. The great wizard laid the doll in his hand. And then he began to chant the secret spell. Kula umbunga, kula umbunga. Nothing happened. The great wizard said, sometimes, my son, you have to try again. Kula umbunga, kula umbunga. And then the doll started to tremble. And then Prince Juni watched as the doll began to rise. Yes, the doll began to rise very slowly, very slowly. The doll rose higher and higher. Prince Juni could not believe his eyes. And then the great wizard said, And the doll laid down. Prince Juni was so inspired that from that day on, he knew how to fly. Good stories and showmanship are essential to turning little mysteries into bigger illusions. But to get really big, magic uses technology. And as in most professions, technology takes some getting used to. Harry Blackstone, seen here in 1952, was a legendary showman. But he seems daunted by the big apparatus. Not a magician anymore, but just the weird man in the black suit, buzzsawing his screaming assistant. When machines first started playing a major role in magic shows 150 years ago, a magician wasn't necessarily involved, and that was the trick. These are automatons, mechanical figures, and in an age of industrial scientific revolution, they were extremely popular. Like magic itself, automatons started small and grew. Eventually they were life-size and performed feats so remarkable, many people thought a magician was indeed involved, either inside or nearby. One of those automatons, Psycho, became more famous than most real magicians at the time. And this was a model Hindu large doll which stood on top of a glass tube, completely separated and isolated from the stage and this doll would play cards with members of the audience usually whist and funnily enough often won as well the cycle that uh, that i have is from uh, harry keller the american magician who uh, had it made in uh, england psycho given to houdini by keller is now owned by illusion designer john gone uh, before its presentation uh, mr keller would invite people out of the audience to help him come up and actually put the piece together. 
And this uh, was very strong because there's, uh, to prove there's, there's no wires, or electricity, or somebody that you don't see working the figure. The original Psycho was created in 1875 by one of the most important people in magical history, a former watchmaker from Cheltenham, England. John Neville Maskelyne founded the prestigious Magic Circle and a Conjuring Dynasty and himself performed until his death at 88. For 29 of those years, at a legendary venue for all magicians, Egyptian Hall, London. John Neville Maskelyne's uh, arrival at the Egyptian Hall was very well timed because magic was just becoming more popular and was becoming recognized as a proper entertainment. Besides creating psycho and practical machines like a cash register and a pay toilet lock, John Neville Maskelyne also refined this for his top-hatted colleagues, the levitation, one of magic's most enduring illusions. The levitation can also be spectacular, as performed by Lance Burton. Jim Steinmeier, illusion builder, coming as close as he can to telling how it's done. The whole notion of a, of a levitation is there's nothing on stage, but uh, there's a lot behind the scenes that are responsible for creating that illusion, and, and quite a bit of science as well. Uh, not necessarily astounding principles of science, but very, very solid applications dating all the way back to the Greeks of, you know, what it takes to hold something up and what it takes in terms of weights and measures and apparatus. Another 19th century European had an even greater effect than masculine on magical performance. Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, the father of modern magic. He was also a watchmaker, a tinkerer, and an innovator par excellence. Robert Houdin said, we're gonna make this a little hipper and slicker and kind of, you know, this is 1848, man. This is not the old days anymore. We have technology. We gotta, we gotta slick this up. We gotta pick up the pace. Everyone in those days was wearing long flowing robes and conical hats with stars and half moons on them and very mystical looking. Indeed, throughout the 19th century, many magicians of all races and nationalities felt compelled to present themselves as wizards, often oriental wizards who covered their stages with real Asian objects. Sometimes they didn't understand these objects, which is why the conjurer Okito, real name Theodore Bamberg, once proudly unveiled a beautiful Chinese scroll that said, please do not urinate in the alley. Robert Houdin changed much of that. He went into normal evening dress, which the amazing thing is, most magicians are still working in a full dress suit to this day, although in his time it was common wear. Robert Houdin used the cutting edge technology of his day as part and parcel of his magic show. Now he also used exquisite sleight of hand and every conceivable conjuring skill, but he used automatic apparatus and watchmaking skills. He used ether as a concept, a theme in presenting one of his illusions. He used electricity uh, to a great extent and experimented with it a great deal at a time when his audience knew not the first thing about it. And Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology will appear as magic and indeed Robert Houdin could not be a better example. He used advanced technology before an audience that mistook it for magic. Robert Houdin never toured outside Europe, but anyone anywhere who's been to a magic show has probably seen his work and most certainly his influence, from magicians in evening dress to the many illusions he created or refined, like the aerial suspension. This is a neon version of that, created and performed by the Pendragon.
how important are mysteries? Incredibly important. Mysteries are things that inspire us. And the magician's function is simply to provide uh, mystery, first and foremost. And that's a valuable function, because I think mystery in and of itself is something that society requires as part of what makes it work. A society without mystery uh, becomes psychotic. The proof of this, to me, is that in contemporary Western culture, there is very little mystery. Like all artists, magicians ponder the appeal and the benefit to society of their art. They provide needed mystery through increasingly spectacular illusions. But now their illusionary colleagues can levitate football stadium-sized spaceships where no man has gone before, not just a few feet off the stage. Yet magic still fascinates. Why? It's about power. The power over the broken, the power over death. And I think that these messages are still subliminally there. And that's how we can account for the, for the enduring appeal of magic to people. A good magician doesn't say, I'm a magician and you're not. A good magician says, I'm a magician and so are you. Before the dawn of time, there was real magic. And the magician reawakens that wonder, that enchantment in us. Wonder reawakened, enchantment reborn, here demonstrated in Peter Samuelson's Snow. You know, when I was a child, I used to go exploring through the house. And I'd always end up here in my father's study, filled with the mementos and souvenirs of a lifetime of travel. I'd play in here for hours. But out of all the wondrous items that were in this room, there was one thing that always caught my eye. On his desk, there was a paperweight. It was made out of glass so that you could see through it. And it was filled with water. Inside was a wintry scene, snow on the ground. And when you shook it up, there was a blizzard, a snowstorm. I always wanted to get inside. What I like about magic is the way in which it inspires skepticism, as a, a, opposed to um, another thing that it can do and does for many people. Oh my gosh, I saw that guy pick a card out of a deck that I thought of. He must have some power over my mind. I think I'll be his slave. Um, you know, you know that's uh, really where it's dangerous. But if that guy can make me think he picked the card out of the deck that I thought of, Oh, then that's possible. Politicians could be doing that to me. Um, advertisers could be doing that to me. I think that's really healthy, you know. So, is it fun to be fooled? Well, maybe in the context of the magician, it is fun to be fooled. In the, in the larger context, it isn't. And that's part of what the magician is saying, I think. That... 
Things aren't always what they seem. There are deceivers about. Wake up. Magic wakes us up in many ways. Paradoxically, it wakes us up to dreams, both good and bad dreams. That may be the key to its enduring popularity. Often without a word, magic speaks to our hopes and our fears. It encourages childlike wonder and adult skepticism. It can be as big as a Las Vegas showroom or as small as your Uncle Bob pulling a quarter out of your ear. And it can be beautiful. Magician Peter Samuelson. As magicians, I think one of the things that we strive to achieve is an element of artistry. And if you approach art, then you really need to ask the question of what is art for or what is it about? And, and I think that it needs to involve a leap of the imagination. It needs to come to a new way of seeing part of the world. major religions or some major religions around the world, there are these themes of life, death, and resurrection. And of course this is going to be mirrored in the pageantry of the magic show, which is a relatively safe space for ordinary people to witness kind of a cosmic pageantry, a retelling of this great myth. It provokes you and stimulates you in another way to think about your life, who you are, what's of concern to you. That's what a great trick does, or any, any great symbol does. It has multiple meanings that you can't rest with. So a magician who presents levitation or flying well is tapping into a very fundamental human need and supporting that need, and we're, we're grateful. Since the earliest times, magic tricks have evolved, especially the grand illusions. The technology has improved, but times and tastes have changed too. Lance Burton is doing a double levitation here, rising skyward lying under a beautiful young woman. If Robert Houdin had tried that, even with Madame Robert Houdin up top, his 19th century audiences would have rioted, but then they'd never been to Vegas. Jeff McBride. Levitation deals with the ancient desire of the human condition to transcend the material world and to evolve towards the spiritual world. That's the nature of life. But sometimes it's just fun to watch. Not all magical manifestations of human desires are as positive and life-affirming as co-ed levitations. There's a lot of masochism in magic. Those grand themes of life, death, and resurrection do indeed include death, and to be resurrected, you must first die. Siegfried and Roy present a hole in Roy.
Although many magic illusions feature images of death, one is infamous for those occasions when it was no illusion. The bullet catch is just that. The magician catches a fired bullet. But at least a dozen times in the past hundred years, something has gone wrong. There was one magician, for example, who used to have the, um, the spectator who was loading this muzzle-loading business. He would have, give him the magic wand to stuff the wadding down in there and get it all ready. And a piece of the magic wand actually broke off in the barrel, and the spectator didn't tell him about it, and fired a piece of the wand through the magician's head, which uh, smartened him up a lot and also killed him. The most famous victim of the bullet truly caught was Chung Ling Su, actually an ex-metal worker named William Robinson, who had also worked as Nan Sahib, Ahmed Ben Ali, Abdul Khan, Hap Singh Lu, and Robinson, man of mystery. But he achieved fame as Chung Ling Su, and even greater fame when he was shot to death in 1918 on stage in London. No wonder the bullet catch made magicians nervous back then. Keller told Houdini, don't do it, and Houdini never did, and it still scares the few who perform it, like Jonathan and Charlotte Pendragon. That is a very dangerous a trick. I mean, it could kill Jonathan. And that always worries me. And I think that's, we probably don't perform it that often because of that it would make me a nervous wreck. And why nobody should ever try it at home. This is a trick. If you don't know the trick, don't do it. When the Pendragons do the bullet catch, Jonathan, not Charlotte, does the catching. But in many magic acts, the magician is the inflictor, not the inflictee. It would seem that in contemporary magic, uh, most of the suffering is done by the assistants. These days, you find strange performances where people are torn apart or skewered, and in other ways, horrible things are done, and it's all done with lots of smiles and, and dancing uh, and fishnet. In other words, smiling, dancing, fishnetted women. The presence and absence of women in magic isn't solely a gender issue. It reveals a lot about the nature of performance magic itself and the nature of the audience. One reason there are so few women in magic is that magic is a display of power. And within this culture, that is something that traditionally has not been acceptable for women. And so for decades, most women have been powerless assistants on the magical stage, referred to in the trade as box jumpers or tray girls. I called them props when I first saw them. I mean, it was incredible. The magician would do something and stand in front of her and take his bow, and, and they would never acknowledge them. Pamela Hayes has been working with her husband Johnny Thompson for 20 years, but even as an assistant, she has power because she seized it. When I met John and married him, I said, now listen, I'm an actress, I have my own life, and I'm not going to carry your stupid birds on and off the stage. Okay, fine. One reason she has power is because she gets laughs, as Trixie, the reluctant assistant who accurately sees herself as her magician's equal. So, my character is an old broad from Las Vegas with chewing gum and an attitude that is like, let's get it over with. Charlotte Pendragon is also her husband's equal on stage, a relationship central to their success. This equality gave us, on stage, relationship, the chance for conflict, the chance for uh, a growing 
in the performance. The female assistant is a very essential part of the, the relationship that makes the magic happen, but it's not always the obvious. And so in my training, it was, it was about empowering the magician by bringing all these elements together and bringing a lot of your focus towards him. Working with Jeff McBride, Luna, daughter of famed magician Shimada, performs some traditional assistant duties. Here she's the levitatee, for instance, but she can do and does far more. I'm at a point of my life where I can join forces with other magicians and working together with Luna helps me express a certain part of myself and also a relationship that I could never express before. A very powerful woman magician and a very powerful male magician working together. Not a male dominant magician subjugating a woman assistant, but two magicians, two aspects of the magician. For me, um, it's, it's very important to be able to present an image to women that is, that is empowering. Magic has been a, a male dominated profession for so many so many years and uh, it's only recently that women have begun to come into their own personal power and are awakening and accessing that. Um, in folklore and legend, uh, the, the sorceress, the oracle, the seer, the witch healer, the shamaness, they've always been with us since the beginning of time. Things are looking up for female magicians and even female assistants. But women still have a long way to go in performance magic. One trick symbolizes how far, of the many different illusions that feature outrages to the body, the dominant trick. The ultimate magic trick of the 20th century, sawing a woman in half. Now, first of all, on the outward level, that's grotesque. What are we doing here? And why are we doing it to cha-cha music? <laughs> There's something about taking a beautiful woman as opposed to a man who has, you know, a strong, powerful hero type and putting them in a compromising position and then doing all these torturous things to them. It, it has an emotional impact on the audience. It hits that button. When Blackstone stepped up to his first midriff in the 1930s, the grand sawing illusion was little more than a decade old but already hundreds of women had been divided worldwide. The trick was invented or refined, it depends on who you ask, by British variety magician P.T. Selbit, the former Percy Tibbles of London, an illusionist already famous for tricks involving the stabbing, stretching, and crushing of women. American Horace Golden claimed he invented the trick, and he certainly improved it by not just sawing through his subject, but actually creating two distinct pieces. Golden's initial mistake was to cut up a man, but eventually he used women exclusively and a very large blade. This happened in the early 1920s, not a coincidence for illusion designer Jim Steinmeier. It's interesting looking at what was happening there, uh, that people had been slightly desensitized to a lot of that through World War I, that uh, women's suffrage was playing a big role in, uh, in the world and that the, there, there was a, a role for a new woman, and that perhaps some of this, maybe accidentally, magicians had stumbled into a kind of social statement being made. Not everyone sees partitioning women on stage as sexist and grotesque. Theologian Robert Neal. It's the shamanistic experience of being destroyed, turned into a skeleton or into parts, and all of it being put back together again. I want to be whole, and if I feel I'm coming apart psychologically or socially or physically, uh, I need to get somehow get back together again. And a magician sort of illustrates the scene, and therefore is, to me, giving hope. Which doesn't explain why it has to be a woman or the worldwide success of Peruvian magician Ricciardi Jr., whose grisly buzz sawing of his blonde daughter included the audience invited up to view her entrails but did not end with the rejoining of the bifurcated blonde. Sometimes Ricciardi just walked off stage. It's a trick, someone said to him once. Of course, said Ricciardi, but the real question is, was it well done?
I think that the, the, the house of magic has many rooms in it, and there's room for everybody. If you just want to do card tricks, there's a group. There's a great group of guys waiting for you. You know, a trick well done is all they ask for in the rooms of the house of magic, and that's one of magic's lasting appeals. Surrounded by looming grand illusions, there will always be space available for card tricks, for old pros like Johnny Thompson, and those following in his footsteps like the remarkable Jamie Ian Swiss. There will be room in the House of Magic for the mentalists, like Max Maven, confounding their audiences with knowledge, not props. See, I maintain it is not a difficult task to manipulate the psychological processes of the adult human mind, and to prove this, we'll try something all together, and we'll see how many of you I connect with this evening. So if you would, please extend your right hand, everyone. If you're confused, that's the one on this side. Good. Extend your right thumb. Extend your right forefinger. Excellent. Make a circle of the thumb and forefinger and touch it to your chin. No, that's your cheek. <laughs> and there will be room for the innovators, like Hiawatha, making ancient skills unique through quiet showmanship. Lance Burton's big show is almost over. One of his last illusions is packing up the portable props and the underclad female familiars. But his work as a magician doesn't end when the curtain falls. He feels a responsibility to his art that transcends performance. There's a lot of knowledge that isn't in books, it isn't in lectures, that's passed on from teacher to student to the next student by word of mouth. And basically that's how magic was learned for the last 5,000 years. And what I try to do with the kids is I try to pass along uh, things that I feel are important uh, as a magician, especially to have a career as a professional magician. I try to pass along things that they can't get from another source. Every year in Las Vegas, Siegfried and Roy sponsor the Desert Magic Seminar, where student magicians from all over the world come to compete and learn. Magicians like Jason Dillon Ace, Ashley Springer, Thomas Meyer. Lance Burton hosts a luncheon during the seminar, putting the young hopefuls together with the old sleight of hands. They can read magic books and find secrets to tricks and, and learn moves, you know, how to make the card disappear. They can learn all that from other sources. But what I try and give them is insight that I've gained through experience or that was passed on to me by another professional magician. Other professional magicians like Channing Pollock and Johnny Thompson, once heroes, then teachers, and now friends. No, wait, I have to tell you the rabbit act. This, this is why you don't do rabbit acts. I had a beautiful $500 set of tails made, and I was working the Playboy Club, so I said, this is perfect. I'm going to do rabbits. So I rehearsed this act, and then I bought this beautiful set of tails. And the first time I tried the act, you know, Birds defecate and urinate all in one shot, but rabbits don't. Oh, <laughs> and they, tell us all about that. <laughs> yes. The first time out, they all did a number on me <laughs> and ruined the $500 set of tails. And this is back in, in the 60s when $500 for tails was a lot of money. So then I tried Pampers. I put costumes on them because of the Playboy. I put little bow ties and jackets. 
but they leak. <laughs> That's why I went back to birds. I remember one time when I was first really hanging out with, with Johnny Thompson, I went over to his house one day, and John helped me and worked. We worked on some things I was doing with doves and, and, and just spent an afternoon with him. And then I, you know, packed all my stuff up, and I was putting it back in my car, and I was like, I feel guilty that I had taken his whole afternoon, and he had given me all this, these gifts of knowledge, and I was like, I felt like, you know, John, uh, you've done all this for me, and I, I don't know what to say, what to do. And he, and he just said, you do the same for somebody else one day. And that's how it is. And that's how it is. Lance Burton has his own theater in Las Vegas now, a $27 million Egyptian hall for the next millennium, in honor of the grand illusion and the simple trick. As Eugene Berger says, there are many rooms in the House of Magic. There's the illusion room, and, and then there's this weird little room in the basement that some of us like to go to. And this is the room that asks, what does this all mean? What does this all mean? The first, last, uniquely human question. Is theatrical magic just a momentary diversion, or is it a glimpse into a fantastical world of dreams and nightmares, possibilities and promises? to my magic show. From every kid doing his first show, to the master conjurers, present and past, what makes magic magic is that all the answers are yes. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you.